disability hardening, which is also referred to as the age hardening. And we'll just quickly go over as to what we did yesterday. The process of precipitation is a reaction where we have a supersaturated solid solution at a given temperature. And with time, it's the those two are saturated solid solution and the second phase precipitates out. In the process of precipitation that occurs is taking place at a low temperature uh, and the saturated, having super saturated solid solution is at must at that temperature. So the salinity of the solute must decrease with decreasing temperature and I said about the sufficient condition we shall arrive at after we understand how the hardening occurs. But only thing we, uh, I said yesterday was that the statement when the interparticle spacing is small, the hardness is more. Okay? Interparticle spacing is large, the hardness will be small. And this is the nucleation rate. That's the growth rate, and so somewhere here we are working in this temperature range. Where both nucleation rate and growth rates are very small, and growth rate in particular is much much smaller than the nucleation rate. And this is how the hardness varies with time. Sixteen. 
years. So we have to wait till then, is it? So what we do is we do artificial aging. We have to cut down that time. Say, for example, I want to use some of your component at room temperature. So at about 50 degrees centigrade or 80 degrees centigrade, where I can get the optimum aging, let's say maybe in four hours or maybe a day's time, I do that process, but do not let it reach the optimum. Allow some scope for more nucleation to go on. Nucleation is still not complete. And from there, I must have reached a reasonable hardness which I can use for uh, application. Then I quench it from there to the room temperature where I am going to use the component. Put it to use, and with time, automatically its hardness will keep on reaching, increasing, and reduce the optimum value. That means it shall remain at least what it is till it reaches the optimum. And that period at room temperature, if it is 10 15 years, you can decide the lifetime of the component. So that is how the artificial aging can help us, but we do not allow it to reach the optimum. We just keep it under optimum and then use the component. And that is what I am trying to say is, at this temperature, if I reach here, quench it, that means you are somewhere here in this graph. So more nucleation is going on, right, and therefore, the impure hardness will keep on increasing. Right? So, hardness will be there. This is where you will not reach the optimum yet. So, more nucleation is to take place. That nucleation will keep taking place. At a lower temperature, it is a much slower process. So, if it is reaching the optimum in a few hours, there it may take place in a few hours, maybe. Right? So, that is the kind of thing which we try to exploit. See, the interparticle spacing has already gone up. Like there is something else in the to go to dissolve the neighboring particles, right? So, solute from those particles, solute from these particles gets into the matrix and gets deposited over to this particle which is going. So, maybe this one dissolves and gets deposited over here. And that's why it grows in size and the others dissolve. That's the process of coarsening, okay? Right, we shall see the mechanism by which this hardening process occurs when I talk about the mechanical behavior. Today we'll talk about another transformation. In that transformation, there are three things happening together. The recovery, recrystallization, and green growth. One after the other in the sequence. 
takes place. We shall see what we do that. The kind of technology is going to help the material uh, getting rid of these imperfections. But first of all, we shall talk about the recovery. The easiest thing to occur occurs first. During recovery, that is the initial stages of while I'm holding at a constant temperature, I'm fermenting constantly, then in the initial temperature range, around the room temperature, when I increase above the room temperature, the recovery phenomenon occurs. During this operation, point defects come to my cobalt first. Point defects can go to the this locations, this location can climb and point defects are down. Okay? Or point defects in both the green borders and get lost. Or point defects can come to the surface and get lost. This is allowing for the high temperature, the diffusion, we can see the force, we can see mechanism, works, and this point defects come to the thermal equilibrium. That's the first thing to happen. After this has happened, now it is possible that the dislocation which are present in the material, it's a general dislocation, really speaking, and all are curvilinear lines. These dislocations are not necessarily straight lines. They are not straight lines, they are just zigzag, and they are not necessarily lying on a single plane. If you consider a slip plane, they may be lying randomly in the volume of the material. Therefore, I am now referring to that small number of dislocations which are of opposite sign and lie on the same slip plane. When they have the thermal energy, because there is an attraction between them, they can jump towards each other and can come close and annihilate each other. So, if that happens, then all the dislocations are given plane will be of the same sign. Opposite signs have got lost. So, some dislocation density comes down, but it doesn't come down very drastically. If I start with what I said, it's about 12 meters of dislocation length per cubic meter of the material, it will become 0.95 into the temperature. Those which are lying on one particular slip plane and are of opposite sign, they can jump towards each other, come close and emulate. But if they are lying on different slip planes, they are the same sign, they will arrange one over the other to form the lower the boundary, which I call the third boundary. This is another phenomenon which occurs during recovery. Once all the slip planes, let us say, are left with all the same sign, then they will try to form the tilt boundaries or the twist boundaries, which are the low angle boundaries. All square dislocations of the same sign can arrange themselves in an array, and that array will form a twist boundary. If all dislocations arrange themselves in an array, they will form a tilt boundary. Thus, green is getting divided into subgreens, and cellular structures can also form like this. This is the other different cell walls which are provided by these dislocations. But it is only for those which are straight lines and lie opposite of one another, lie on the same plane, or they are the same sign lying on different planes. Right? So that means this means this is all, all dislocations as I told you are not straight lines. So my dislocation density in this person doesn't go down. Really speaking, from 10 to 12, when we get 0 0.95, 0 0.97, 10 to 12, it's only decrease. No? That's the kind of thing that may happen at the most. And that's why I make it a point to mention that this does not lead to a substantial decrease in the dislocation density. Once this is all done, I say recovery is over. And during this operation, I will show you some properties. Those which are affected by the point defects, or the electrical conductivity, or the electrical resistivity, they get recovered. Because they are affected by the point defects, and the point defects are more, they are changed. Now, point defects are coming to equilibrium, 
it is again come back to normal value. So both properties get changed during recovery. The other pro the properties which are not affected by the point effects, but affected by the dislocation, they do not get recovered. They do not change. Right. Now, recrystallization is the process which occurs now next. It is basically, you see the point effects are completely covered. What I am left with is internal boundaries and dislocation, high dislocation density. Next step is provided by the high dislocation density. Dislocations have the strains around them. It is a general dislocation normally, they have a generalized state of strain. In case of high dislocation, I have mostly principal strains, compressive and densile strains. In case of screw dislocation, I have shear strains. So, the strain energy is stored which are called strain grains in the form of energy of dislocations. And these, when they have the thermal energy, go to become strain free grains. That is dislocation free. Dislocation get out. This process usually occurs by formation of small nucleus and migration of the grain boundary which is formed. The nucleus is of the same material, same crystal structure, only thing is without dislocations. And then the grain boundary jumps to make it bigger and bigger in size. So, the migration of the grain boundary which is involved. So, driving force of the process, as I said, is the stored strain energy of dislocations. And the energy of the dislocations, you recall, stored is mu by square by 2 into the dislocation density, permanent volume of the material. Mu by square by 2 is permanent length. The density is length permanent volume of the material. So, therefore, this is the energy stored joule per cubic meter. That is the delta G, right, for the process. Now, the process, as I said, is I have a green boundary, let us say. In here, I have less dislocation density. Here, I have more dislocation density. So, green boundary moves in the left. So, more dislocations. less dislocations. So, green boundary shall move towards that region where there are more dislocations. In other words, try to consume that dislocated material into a less dislocated material, a fewer dislocation material. So, that increases in size. Right? That is the basic process of recrystallization. So, what is the effect of this process? and how it controls the process of recrystallization. Before I proceed further, let me ask you one thing. In the classical nucleation mechanism, we talk about the free energy chain delta G. And from delta G we work out the activation energy. Same way I can work out the activation energy for this process also. But there the delta G was changing the temperature of transformation. At the equivalent temperature it is 0. As the temperature is lower and the cooling is increased, delta G increases. That will be the negative sign. Here also is a negative sign. Because the strain free grains have no energy, strain grains and dislocation energy is there. So, this minus this shall become negative value actually. The driving force is always taken as minus of delta G, so it becomes positive. Driving force is positive for the process, while free energy change is negative. One is opposite of the other, really speaking. In this case, what would happen if I hold it at 100 degrees or I hold it at 90 degrees or I hold it at 120 degrees? Would delta G change? 
to this happens in one hour. So there must be some delta star, some delta T, some this pre exponential term, all these things are taken care of. So I've defined with respect to time, with respect to the extent of the uh, uh, this thing, the uh, crystallization, and uh, the rate that is specified. It should occur in one hour, 50% of the crystallization, that temperature. Generally, it lies in the range of 0.3 to 0.5. That's why roughly we say about 40 percent. Because it lies between 0.3 and 0.5 for the Leiden bulb once expressed in Calvin. Okay. So that's the way it is. But when it is 0.3, when it is 0.5, we shall discuss a lot of factors which control these parameters here. That's what we have to look at. You know? Now the second thing is First thing I said, this delta of star is not a function of temperature. Once a nucleus is formed, which is free of dislocations, some dislocations that have been sent out, and a particle is formed containing, let's say, 200 atoms or 100 atoms. When this cluster of atoms dissolve back to have more than only a dislocated region, can it? It is not possible for it to remember where the dislocations were. It cannot go back to that state. So once a particle is formed, it cannot dissolve back like an embryo. These are the two basic differences why many people do not consider it a phase change. Right? But delta F star or delta G does not change with the temperature of transformation. Solution. It's a function of the cold working. And at the same time, the embryos cannot dissolve back. They can only grow in size. Okay? Now let's look at the parameters which control the temperature of the solution. First is the degree of cold work. That means more the cold working you do, more dislocation is stored, the density of dislocation is higher. That means delta G is higher. If delta G is higher, delta of star will be small. Delta of star is smaller, nucleation rate will be faster. That means the crystallization rate will be faster. But I will only 50% of the crystallization in one hour. So temperature has to be lower. What is that? Again, let's go back to this expression. See, delta G is more when you do the more cold work, okay? So, delta of star, which you had written earlier, I'm writing for the energy is nucleation only. Once delta G is more, delta of star will be less. If I had to keep this constant, for so this has become smaller, this should also become smaller. So this is the temperature of the crystallization because I am maintaining a constant, that is it. So, because the temperature would become lower if I do more cold working. Because the temperature would be higher if I do less cold working. Is it clear? Let's see all the other parameters which affect these parameters here. We will come back to this expression. Next, we will note the initial grain size. Initial grain size means just before we started deforming it. Grain size could be a smaller grain size, grain size could be larger grain size. The process of recursion, as I told, occurs in the grain boundaries. To start with, if it is a fine grain size, you will have no nucleation sites. If it is a coarse grain size, you will have less nucleation sites. Let us go back to it. It is affecting this. Delta of star will not be affected, that is a function of the degree of cold work. But the brain size, initial brain size is going to affect where, whether this number is large or number is small. For fine grain materials, N2 is large, but this is a constant. To maintain this constant, this number should go down. The number should go down mean temperature should become lower. Okay? So, fine grain material, 
for the form and type of the slice of the slice of the loaded butcher. And the coarse grain material will be formed and be slice into the slice of the hardened butcher. Okay? That's what you see with this. Right? Then come the temperature of cold working. I'll just explain if I can deform a material at room temperature and deform at 200 degrees centigrade, the difference is the dislocation density which gets stored at room temperature, the row is more than what is getting stored at 200 degrees centigrade for the same deformation, for same reduction in the cross sectional area. At room temperature, I uh, store more dislocations, at 200 degrees centigrade, I store less dislocations. The delta G at 200 degrees centigrade is less delta G at if it is deformed at 200 degrees centigrade and if it is deformed at room temperature, it is more. That means, that means delta F star is more when delta G is less. That's a two high temperature coal working. High temperature coal working delta F star is more means that the equilibrium becomes smaller for the temperature has to rise. So if I deform at 200 degrees centigrade high temperature, my recursion temperature is also higher. If I deform at deform a lower temperature, my recursion temperature is low. Right? Then comes a very important one, the purity or composition of the metal. In the material, impurities can be present in two forms, in the dissolved form or the undissolved form. In dissolved form, it is a solute, and in the undissolved form, it's a second phase particle. Okay? Both second phase particle and the solute, solute, I am at the level of the atom. Undissolved particle, second phase, it's a particle, it's an ensemble of hundreds of thousands of atoms. Please keep it in mind, there's a difference between the two. Solutes when they are present, they drag the green boundary and the undissolved particles if they are present, they pin down the green boundary. Right? So, what is that solute dragging effect and what is the pinning effect? Let us look at that. This is the solute, this blue atom, this is the matrix. You see that it stains the neighborhood, it compresses the blue one. Small, similarly, if I put a smaller one, it would have got the tensile strains around it. No strain mat in the matrix, and there is a strain in the extra strain energy. Let us say there is a green boundary which is migrating upwards, let us say, and the green boundary while migrating comes here. And this solute becomes a part of the green boundary. You notice that now the strains are not as much as they were there. This is having less energy as compared to that. Stored energy here is more, stored energy here is less. That means this kind of configuration is energetically favorable. If the green boundary migrates further, this will go back to this kind of situation because this has not become a part of the green. In the way, when a green boundary migrating comes near the solute, solute goes into the green boundary. The energy is lowered, and that energy which is lowered goes waste as heat. It's not available to for us to do any work. But once the green boundary tries to migrate away from it, it has to increase that energy level again, and this energy has to be provided by the thermal energy. Nobody is doing the work, so thermal energy will have to concentrate to provide that energy there. That means process is slowed down. Activation energy for the process has gone up, so process is slowed down. So therefore, migration of the green body becomes difficult once the green body reaches here. This is referred to as the solute drag effect. More the solute in the matrix, green body will be having failing to are facing such situation at more places. The less the solute, it will be facing in the less places. So, solute present in the matrix, the solid impurity, will like to drag the green boundary and increase the recrystallization temperature. Right? So, if the 
it's only this percent in the matrix, the decreasing temperature will be higher. And if solute is not percent, it will be lower. Like, so for example, for pure aluminum, decreasing temperature without any impurities could be around 75 degrees centigrade. But commercially pure aluminum, it would be about 175 degrees centigrade. It goes up. Let's look at the green boundaries, which are pinned on the second phase particle. Here is the second phase particle, which is lying in this grain. And this is the grain boundary, which is trying to migrate. And it's trying to migrate in this direction. I have certain green boundary energy stored in the material. And I also have certain interfacial energy stored in the material. Now, when this green boundary migrates, comes near the second phase particle, this is the cross section of the green uh, the inter, uh, sorry, the uh, particle with the green boundary, this green one. In that area, I don't have any green boundary. But interfacial area is still the same, no different. But in that cross-section area, I don't have the green boundary. So, if such particles are present in the matrix, green boundary faces them, and wherever it comes in contact, that cross-section area is no more the green boundary. In other words, the green boundary area in the material decreases. As the green boundary area decreases, the green boundary energy still decreases. It's a lower energy configuration as compared to this. The two energies out of which one has not changed, but the other one is reduced. Once that happens, the energy which is lost goes waste as heat again. But when this migration goes on, green boundary has to come out, the particles to be left behind in another way, that energy is the same as this. The entire green boundary plus this interfacial area. So now this is again high energy configuration. Area has come back, and that extra energy has to be provided by the thermal energy only. So, process becomes difficult and slows down. We say the green boundary has been pinned by the particle. This is a particle containing maybe hundreds of atoms or thousands of atoms. It is not a single atom like the solute which I showed you earlier. Don't get confused with those things. Atom is one single atom. This is group of atoms here. Yeah, is a particle. It could be a crystalline material. Could be glassy phase. All right. So this is how the second phase, if it is present in the matrix, can pin down the green boundaries and slow down the process. So whether I have an impurity which is dissolved or I have an impurity which is not dissolved, insoluble, both ways. The process of migration of the green boundary is slowed down, and thereby decreasing temperature goes up. So, in pure materials, or the alloys will normally find having higher decreasing temperature than pure metals. So, decreasing temperature is a function of purity that way. And for pure materials, slow plus point three. For the impure material, depending upon the impurity content, towards 0.5. That's why normally we are told that about 40% is the melting point. But I would say it is between 30% and 50%. Okay? The question temperature will lie between 30% and 50%. Right. Once the decrystallization is over, means all over the volume, the decay gains, uh, strain free gains are far lower. All strain gains are lost. The whole volume is filled. I say the crystallization is complete. So far, I define only the crystalline temperature as that where 50 percent occurs. But now, the process will go to completion when 100 percent volume is filled with the crystal strains. When that has happened, I am left with in the material, let's say the slipping dust has come down very low and no dislocation energy. But I am left with fine grain structure in the material. That means a lot of grain body area. Once I have a lot of grain body area, that also increases the flow energy of the material. Because the grain body is also not in thermodynamic equilibrium. 
So it increases the free energy of the material that's driving force now. This screen bond is like to go out. After the session is over, what takes place is again growth. Increase in the average grain size following the decrystallization. So driving force here is the reduction in the grain bond energy. Because when we have fine grains, we did one problem in the car. The grain bond area is stored when the volume of the material is 3 divided by the grain diameter. Smaller the diameter, more the grain bond area is stored when the volume of the material. Larger the diameter, smaller the grain bond area is stored. That means grain bond area is stored. So, tendency now is to have these weak stars grains which are fine in size, they become bigger, they become coarser, and thereby reduce the grain bond energy. And again, here, it's basically a process of grain bond migration. And grain bond migration is affected by the impurities. So, grain growth is obstructed by the solids, which are the zone impurities, it's affected by the second phase particles, the way it affects the decrystallation. And grain growth will be slow up with the impurities present. That is, grain bodies will be dragged by the solutes, grain bodies will be pinned down by the second phase particles. And the grain growth will be a slow process. Right? The dying phase is to get rid of the grain body energy stored in the material. That has to get out of the material. Okay. So that's the process of grain growth. Now, we should be able to assume that when the grain growth occurs, ultimately you should be able to remove all the grain bodies and you will get a single crystal. Some attempts have been made by defining the materials like that to get a single crystal, yes. But not always. There should be only one nucleus to grow that will give you the single crystal. What happens in the grain growth process is <coughs> to be seen very carefully. Let's make it here itself. So this is grain 1, this is grain 2. If I look at an atom which is here, and an atom which is here, I'm looking at the atom of the grain, which belongs to the low free energy side and which belongs to the high free energy side.
some microstructure you will see nowadays like that? An old copper, very good. So, when I have an atom here now and an atom on this side, what is the difference in the energy of the two? No. So, such a boundary has no tendency to migrate. So, ground growth does not go on indefinitely. Like we would like it to become a single crystal. But this will stop somewhere here. Then it becomes flat boundaries. And copper, I showed you the boundaries are becoming flat. That's the green growth done at about some 800 degrees centigrade. That specimen has been kept for a length, good length of time. So the green boundaries try to migrate to make the grains bigger and bigger. And green growth has uh, taken place. That's where it stops. Once it becomes flat, the competition of the atom to jump from left to right and right to left is the same. Or bind bond is unable to migrate. Okay? Here it is migrating because this atom when it goes to the other side lowers its free energy. But the boundary by the time it comes to the left. So that's how the bond is moving towards the center of curvature of the grain. <coughs> when the grain growth occurs. And you will notice that this has happened the other way around in the crystallization. In the crystallization, you have, let us say, this is one grain, this other grain, the particle is nucleating the grain boundary, and the grain boundary is then because moving. So it's moving away from the center of curvature. But when the green growth occurs, the boundary begins to move towards the center of curvature. And that's the reason why we say the smaller greens are eaten up by the bigger greens. Now, let me now show you what happens to the properties or uh, structure and then the properties. Here, uh, is the configuration axis. On this configuration axis, let us say this is the cold working. This is the region of recovery, the region of recrystallization. structure. 
So what has happened? To start with, I have equated grains, whatever the grain size is of the material. When I deform these, they start elongating in the direction of rolling. In the direction of deformation, they begin to elongate. When they elongate in the direction of rolling, they also get crushed. The more and more they do of coal work, they get crushed and become thin long grains.
during the cardiac acceleration. So during recovery, it remains the same. But during the crystallization, when the dislocation is getting becoming less and less, strength comes down. And strength comes down further when the brains grow in size. I told you that the fine grain materials are better mechanical properties. Strength comes down when I increase the grain size. But the more the dislocation, strength comes down. When I deform, the strength goes up. Because I increase the dislocations. I also crush the grains. I increase more internal boundaries. So therefore, it goes up. But the strength remains constant during recovery because it's not affected by the point defects. Okay? And that's, I think, the, the uh, another property which should be Resistivity should go up with the car cold working. That's the same opposite of electrical conductivity, I think. One must have ductility. So that goes up, and with the recovery, it takes recover, and the only weakest agent goes down further slightly. So some properties which are affected by the point defects, they get recovered during recovery itself. Some properties which are affected by the dislocations, they get recovered during recrystallization. Why recovery means you are recovering some of these properties just strongly dependent on the point defects. 